I was at a conference in 2008, and I was with one of my counterparts. He had a company in Canada that was really similar to our company in the U.S., um, similar size. We were on the same technology stack, like very, very aligned philosophically. And we were having a drink at the bar, and he said, hey, do you, uh, do you measure your frontline employee turnover? And I said, yeah, we do. And he said, well, well what is it? And I said, we're about 115%. And he looks at me and he's like, that's fantastic. And I thought, how could you say that's fantastic? And I, I, I said, really? And he said, we're at 150% and we're beating the industry average by a lot. If, if you're at 115, you're doing great. And I looked at him, I said, Doug, why do we tolerate? Like, why do we, why do we think that's good? There's got to be a better way. So we were Rockefeller Habits, quarterly themes. I come home from the conference and we decide our quarterly theme is going to be really n drilling in on this turnover problem and how can we attack it from, you know, lots of directions. And we talked about a bunch of initiatives, but we settled on this idea of Dream On. Dream On, Make-A-Wish charity model, but for our inside staff. Now, what was interesting at the time, 115% turnover at the front line, 3% turnover at the salaried employee level. So you could imagine what it was like to come to work. We really had a class warfare problem going on. We have this quarterly theme and we come out with this idea of dream on. And of course, you know, we, we, we've got no turnover in our group, we're super aligned. We think it's a brilliant idea and we roll it out. And we, we roll it out the way you would submit a dream would be through an email address. You would, you would write to dream on at you know, appletreeanswers.com and and about a week goes by and we don't get a single submission, not even from the 3% salaried people, but more importantly, the frontline group, no one submits a dream. And we literally thought maybe the email was broken. Maybe, maybe we didn't set the email up properly because how could this amazing program go ignored? And so we do another big marketing push and finally we get this really sheepish submis submission from an employee in our office in St. Louis. And through a really unfortunate sequence of events, including a divorce, turns out she was homeless and living in a car with two of her kids. Now, you want to get humbled as an entrepreneur, find out one of your people that you're responsible for is homeless. We got her in a hotel that night. Two nights later, we had her in her own apartment. We bought some furniture. We worked with her landlord to get a, a favorable lease for her. And Long story short, two nights later, she's in the apartment. Total win for everybody. Didn't cost us very much money. Was, was really easy to make happen. We had one problem. Dream on, what our promise was it was 100% confidential. So if we granted a dream, we're trying to you know, build this momentum. If we grant a dream, we're not going to tell anyone anything other than, hey, a dream's been granted. So we, we called our employee and we said, hey, you know, we're going to do all this, and but good news, it's totally confidential. You don't have to tell anyone. We're not going to tell anyone. And she said, not tell anyone. I'm telling everyone that will listen. This story is amazing. So it spreads like wildfire throughout the organization. Amazingly, two days later, the almost identical situation in another office, divorce, homeless employee, we do the same thing there. And Dream On literally kind of takes root and, and spreads like wildfire from that point. From, from those two days through the time we sold the company, we granted about 250 to 300 different dreams. They were all over the map. They ranged from we published a book of Spanish poetry for our, one of our employees in Puerto Rico. We bought a tombstone for someone's grandmother. We actually hosted a 40th anniversary party for two people I'm sure I'll never meet. Uh, we sent a mom to San Diego to spend Christmas with her daughter in the Navy. Just all these amazing stories that came out of Dream On. And, you know, I, I, we stopped actually measuring the return on investment. The, the program was such a massive success. And, and it really, at the end, it wasn't even about cutting down on turnover or, or any of those things. It was about connecting with employees at a, at a, you know, at a deeper level. And we had an employee in our office. She's one of the first 15 employees that, that we ever had at the company. And her 28 year old husband had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and had been diagnosed. He was given a 10% chance to live. It was stage four and this was September. And they said, and they had two little kids. And they said, you really need to start thinking about he's not going to be here for Christmas and start to make your plans. And a really, obviously, dark time for that family and everything that was going on. So 
uh, his wife worked for us and his sister also worked with us. And his sister, on behalf of his wife, submitted a dream on, on behalf of her sister-in-law uh, for Dan to go to one more NFL Philadelphia Eagles football game. He was a huge Philadelphia Eagles fan, and they wanted him to go see one more game before he passed away. So, again, we take a lot of this stuff for granted. I'm a season ticket holder with our local NHL team, the Philadelphia Flyers. I call a friend of mine who works there. I tell her the story. She calls her counterpart at the Eagles, and they totally spring into action. So they set it up for Dan to be on the sidelines before the game. Uh, there's pictures of him hanging out with the refs and much to his wife's dismay with the cheerleaders. And uh, so he spends pregame on the sideline, and then – they actually put him in the suite with the wives and girlfriends for the game. They're treated so, so nicely there, and everyone's super supportive. And then after the game, they bring Dan down. They put him right outside the locker room. They give him a football, and one by one, every player on the team comes out with a, with a Sharpie, and they sign the football and shake his hand, and, hey, man, good luck in your, you know, in, in your fight. And they had asked ahead of time who his favorite player was. It was a guy named Sheldon Brown. The last guy out of the locker room, number 53 of 53, it's Sheldon Brown. He's in a suit and tie, but he's wearing the jersey that he wore during the game. He takes the jersey off, he signs it, and he spends 20 minutes with Dan. And I call Vern two weeks later, and I tell him this story. And he's, you know, obviously, wow, that's amazing. He said, did you say lymphoma? And I said, I said, yeah. And he said, is he the firstborn son in his family? And I said, Vern, I don't know. He's the husband of one of my employees. I, I don't actually know him. And he said, well, you got to find out. Now, remember, Vern was on the board at Reardon Clinic and had been exposed to all this cutting-edge cancer research. And he said, listen, I just read a piece of research at Reardon. Um, if he's a firstborn son, that could, that could play into this. He goes, but more importantly, is he estranged from his father? And I said, Vern, I, I don't know if he's a firstborn son. I don't know if he's estranged from his father. That's a weird question. He goes, Listen, you have to find out. There's this huge correlation between firstborn sons estranged from their dad and lymphoma. And I said, I'll, I'll ask. So I called Jackie, and our employee, and I said, I'm going to ask you some weird questions. Just play along. I said, hey, is Dan firstborn? She said, yeah, he's the oldest. He has two sisters. I said, is there any chance he's estranged from his dad? And she, she kind of said, how, how do you know that? Like, why would you ask that? That's, how do you know that happened? And I said, I don't but tell me about it. And she said, yeah, about, about eight or nine months ago, he had a huge fight with his dad, and a couple days later, his dad had a heart attack and passed away. And when his dad died, they, were, they were, weren't talking. And now Dan's sick, and he feels horrible about it, and he doesn't know what to do, and he hasn't reconciled it. So I share the research with her, and I said, listen, at the very least, let's just get him in some therapy. We can start right away. Let's figure it out. And if nothing else comes of it, at least you know he can – he can pass away in peace. So this is in October of 2009. He goes back to his doctor in January of 2010, and the doctor says, Dan, we think we made a mistake. We can't find any sign of the lymphoma. Uh, we think we misdiagnosed you. Now, I could show you a picture of Dan outside the locker room getting the football sign, and I promise you we did, he was not misdiagnosed. But for some reason, somehow, some way, that, that little spark of hope and that little bit of kind of encouragement, uh, whether, whether we had an impact or, you know, he, he did it himself or whatever happened, but uh, Dan was cancer-free in three months. That was in 2010. Dan is still alive and well today. In fact, he's a union plumber and super healthy and still a Philadelphia Eagles fan. And um, we don't always understand the impact that we have, I think, as leaders and, and certainly as entrepreneurs. And, you know, business is great and business is business, but this is about people and this is about we own the experience and we're responsible for the people that show up every day to make our businesses and our lives and our dreams come true. And people come to work as people, not as employees. And, and if we, can, if we can change the conversation here, I think it's the, the foundation of building great employee engagement and building a great culture that you know, we take a really holistic view. So many great things came out of Dream On, but, but from the day we started until the day we sold the company 
And again, it was a lot of initiatives, but I really believe this was the most important one. We took frontline employee voluntary turnover from 115% to 18%. And, you know, again, we could, we could calculate the value of that over and over, but it was so fundamentally valuable relative to what we spent on Dream On that we literally stopped measuring. Our new KPI was how do we grant as many dreams as we possibly can because they're moving the needle in a massive way in our business.